All right, welcome into the second episode of the Goodman and Hummel podcast, and uh, this is going to be a good one, Rob. A really good one. Uh, a legend got, is here. We got a legend on the line. Ted Valentine is here with us, and uh, ten Final Fours, four championship games, Teddy. Yes. And uh, Ted, Teddy, TV, Teddy. What, what, what do we call you? Well, let's see. My mother always called me Theodore when she was angry. <laughs> um, my uh, college students always called me Ted. Um, never was called Teddy until the fans started going Teddy. Okay. <laughs> Teddy, Teddy. So that's where I got that from the fans. So, Hey, it is what it is. Who gave you TV Teddy? Oh, uh, just happened to be, that's, a, that's my initials, Ted Valentine. So, I mean, uh, somebody was very, very creative. He's always on TV. So it's Teddy Valentine. So they start calling me TV Ted. So that's when I was younger, you know, do you like, do you it? feel like you've, have you embraced it? Like, do you like it? Let me tell you what, it must be like, I must be one of those people that the more upset you get with me, the more I kind of just do my thing. <laughs> That's just how I am. I use all that, all, I take all that negativity and I turn it into something, you know, basically what I do. I mean, it's just that uh, I had to get over that at a young age because you always worry about what everybody says about you and everybody, well, I'm in a sport to you, either they either love you or they dislike you. So that's just, I've, I've embraced it. It is what it is. I think that as I've gotten older, it has, sub, it has subsided a whole lot. Uh, now I always hear, when are you going to retire? When are you going to retire? When are you retire? When are you retire? When are you retire? <laughs> and uh, now is that other aspect. Um, I kind of embrace it more because the fans are more lovable now, I think. Uh, they're, fans are a lot different than it was because this will be my 39th season and fans are just they're just who they are I mean it's just I feed off of them I do I just feed off of them <laughs> I mean we can no, tell hey we can tell no doubt <laughs> I just feed off of them I mean because they give me a lot of they give me a lot of vibe I make faces now I'm more I more giggle and more laugh at them now probably than whatever it's not it isn't too bad because I've learned about the fans if you become antagonistic with them they become antagonistic with you so it, it, it's got to be me. I get blamed for games that I didn't even work. Okay. I get blamed for calls other officials make. Now all of a sudden my past, I was an ex educator. Now it's always, they're always screaming at me. Hey, go over and help him. Get him on the same page you are. I mean, it's like, I mean, but it, it's a, put it this way. I love what I love doing what I do. I just love it. I always have. Ted, I've always wanted to ask you if you remember this, and I'm guessing you probably don't because, like you said, you've ref for 39 years. But my my last year at Purdue, it's 2012. We're playing Indiana, and it's at Mackey. You're refing the game, and our we're, we're losing by, like, four at the under-four timeout, and by, like, the two-minute mark, we're down 18. They've got, like, Oladipo. They've got Cody Zeller, and we miss a shot, and – I knock it out of bounds, but I, I thought that maybe the other the other crew members with you are Mike Sanzier and Pat Driscoll. Okay. And Sanzier calls it Indiana ball, and I literally go crazy on it. And I, I probably deserve to get a technical, but as I'm walking away, you scream my last name. You go, Hummel! And you literally, <laughs> I look back, and you're like, you've been in this league a long time, and you're a hell of a lot better than that. And I felt like I let my father down. Like I literally did. I like it literally, I, I, it changed my mindset in the moment. And I'm guessing you don't remember it, but it has oh, yes, always stuck with me. It's yes, always stay with me the way, the way that you yeah. said that, like right. just the, the respect that I have for you as an official, but also the way you, you worded it. I, I was like, man, I really let this dude down. Well, well, I think we all represents our fathers in some way because uh, I represent mine because I was I was only his only child and he was a Marine. So it, it, it is always I always carry that with me. Don't let my father down, even though he, that he may be gone. Don't embarrass my name. I mean, don't embarrass his name. And uh, I've always carried that. And it was just always that you, you I could always recognize players because especially when you've been around them if you've been around gene case players i've been around gene case players since uh since i came in the big 10 in 1986 
Yep. So I was always familiar with every player, like Matt Payne or uh, Big Dog Rock. I was always familiar with all the uh, uh, Quanzo, uh, Martin. I was always familiar with all the good players. I mean, I was always was by their personality because their personality on the court always told me basically who they were as a person just about. Ted, go back to when you first started to get into officiating. There was a story about – you in Bristol, Connecticut, I heard of yes, a, of a, yes, of a yes. ice cooler or something. <laughs> yeah, what? Um, I think. Let's see, where was I? I was like twenty-two years old, I think. Yeah, twenty-two. I just got out of college. I started teaching high school. In fact, I teach at the same high school. I taught at the same high school that where Brad Paisley went to, really? and uh, Cynthia Bissett, Lady Gaga's mother. So they were. So she was in high school with me. Brad Paisley was years after behind me. I mean, after me. Um, we went to Bristol, Connecticut, and back then, Bristol, Connecticut, um, at ESPN, it was like a trailer, just about, um, that they had, and, uh, we went to the camp to, to a private school under the instructor of J. Dallas Shirley, may he rest in peace, there's a manual, NCAA manual was named after him, uh, a lot of great referees came through him, Jim Howe, Jim Birch, Lenny Works, Joe Forte, a whole lot of great referees came through the Southern. So I decided, well, I'm going to go to this camp, being a poor kid from West Virginia, that I decided, well, I go to this camp. And I was always was a sports-oriented type person, very daredevil -ish, never was never afraid of anything, basically. And um, so we went to a break, and we had a styrofoam cooler in the room, three of us. And uh, basically got to being Darren and whatever it is, nice sunny day, and there were these two gorgeous women. They were laying out, there, and they were sunbathing, and and um, they said, well, you know, dare this. And we were going, hey, honey, and all this stuff. You know, just, you know, just young, immature people at the time. And so they probably dared, you know, the cooler of water. And they were just going back and forth. So I grabbed the cooler. I said, I'll do it. And I took it and took the, through the water out the window and hit these three ladies. Well, all the obscenities come flying back up and yelling, and we're behind the wall. We're laughing, you know, because we really think this is funny, you know. Well, Lord behold, that if you know something about water, it leaves a trail down the wall. So uh, we go off break, and Mr. Shirley and the, and the head guy, headmaster of the place, big guy, had to be about seven foot tall, huge dude. And Mr. Shirley stopped all three of us going to class and said, young men, what did you guys do? And we're stuttering around and this and that and, you know, jamming around. And he said, before we before we get, get somebody start telling it, there's a water trail coming from your room, basically what he said. <laughs> so I kind of like wheezing my hand up. Yeah, Mr. Shirley, I did it. I'm so, so sorry. You know, I threw it. I threw it. And I had to apologize. And I apologized to the guy and his, and his family, you know. So uh, I was brought up the right way. Um, so Mr. Shirley told us in camp, he said, well, young man, I'm sorry, but you need to pack up and you need to leave. I said, what? He said, you need to leave the camp. So the guy I came with, he had a car, so he drove. So he had to leave the camp too because, because I had to ride back with him. So all the way back, he cussed me all the way back. I was younger than him. And, and so um, in the that, that summer, I'm sitting around. And I get a letter from the Southern Conference. I'm going, what's, you know, what's the letter for? So I open the letter up. It's, it, it's a letter from J. Dallas Shirley, the Southern Conference. and says, uh, you've been invited to join the staff of the Southern Conference. I said, what? I said, no, nah, this got to be wrong. This can't be happening. Well, lo and behold, so I happened to dial him up. And I said, Mr. Shirley, my name is Ted Valentine, you know, so and so and so and so. So I received a letter from you about joining the Southern. He says, he, he always had a way of had a little father, he touches a young man. He says, uh, I felt that you deserve to be in, in the Southern. You got a long way to go to grow up, but if you're standing up and you and you got some honesty and you got lots of honesty and a lot of integrity, you're the type of person that I'm looking for. And that's how I got in the Southern Conference staff. I wouldn't advise anybody to go out and do that anymore, you know, but <laughs> you don't think of it. But that's how I got into the Southern Conference at age 23 years old. And it's been going ever wow. since. Wow. Ted, I, I think the great thing about college basketball has to be like the fans. And whether you're in the Big Ten, the ACC, all the conferences you ref, you've refed everywhere. Do you have a favorite place to call a game? 
Oh, my goodness gracious. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. My first league game was at Mackey Arena in really? the Big Ten. Yeah, I was 26 years old, 930. They had, uh, I think, Gary Grant at the time was playing for Michigan, I think. Mm-hmm. And that's the first time I met Coach Katie, um, Kevin Stallings, Steve Lavin, all those guys. They were at, like, Purdue. Because I know because I lived in Columbus, Ohio, and I got there five hours for the game. So I basically was all excited, whatever it is, and I got there five hours for the game. It was my first time in the Big Ten as far as a, as far as a conference play. But Mackey, I always love Mackey because it's always – it's a big floor, big big aprons, big sideline. You're not running into people. Um, I love Vanderbilt. Some people mm-hmm. don't like Vanderbilt. Well, I love Vanderbilt because it's big, yeah. coaches over your shoulders. So, you know, you got to get the play right. The coaches over your shoulders, okay? But I always love those places like Minnesota – I've always loved those floors. That you love in. those elevated floors, huh? Yes, Where you're on and stage. I, and that's why I love them final fours, because you're up on the stage, and you, <laughs> it, it's either you perform or you don't perform, or you go home, you know? Yeah. Um, yep. But I've always liked those arenas. I've always, I've always loved those places. Those were always my atmosphere. And I can say this, maybe because of Coach Katie, and that it's about Mackey. It is something about – being in Mackey Arena, it was just different. I just, I just l- loved it because there was one time that where they changed the time of the game, and I don't know if you were playing there or not, like Robbie, and they changed the time of the game. And I think this may have been Matt Painter's maybe first year, maybe first year coaching, and we got there late and we were dressing, and I was the first guy to walk out on the floor at Mackey, and the fans stood up and cheered and I went to the middle of the court and I, and I bowed all four sides. Okay. <laughs> Everybody bust out laughing and Mackey's always been my spot. I just, I just always love the people. I just, there's something about Mackey. There's something about Minnesota. There's something about Vanderbilt. I'd rather work those places. Probably people talk about, well, go to Duke and all other places. Yeah. That's cool, but it's just something about those other atmospheres. They have they have more, I don't know, I don't know, uh, I don't know the right word probably to use, but they have like more electric in them. I mean, yeah. I mean, when you go to Mackey, you get to see the see the you see the big mascot and you get to see uh, the fans and the fans stand and cheer and fans yell. They wear the sea of they wear black and and I, I just, I just always loved it. I just, I, I, I told Coach K that last week because I speak to him like maybe like once a month or whatever. And Mackey was one of my favorite places to go. It really was. So I get an update on the Gene Katie Ted Valentine golf standings because I know that that's been well, something that that happens a lot. We haven't played yet. We, we haven't played yet because we were supposed. To, I was supposed to get together with he, myself, Tubby Smith, and. Um, um who's my man there um cliff ellis so we had a standing we're supposed to have a standing game a few years ago and i had a very very bad vertigo attack so i couldn't play so um they called me at my house and and they was just ribbing on me i'm just <laughs> ripping me. they just all three of them just ripped me to death you know but but i talked to talk to coach katie once every blue moon and and I haven't caught up with him because of the COVID. I mean, because I've been to Myrtle Beach and I see him like now and then. But I mean, but I always, I always love, enjoy, I enjoy visiting him. I do. So, all right, give me, <clears throat> give me your craziest story with a coach that wouldn't let it go. Somebody that you got into it with on the court, maybe you teed up or whatever, you got into it with, and, and they, they followed you out of the arena. They're, they're, oh. they're, they're banging on the, the, the officiating door. Whatever yeah. it was, give me the craziest damn story ever with a coach. I'd say it'd probably be Bill Foster. May he rest in peace. He, he was a coach of Northwestern uh, the first year, first couple of years. And we could never get along. I don't know what the deal was. As I got older, I kind of thought I got a little better. He was just always on me. Always on me. Always. And one night he was at he was at um, Minnesota and I was with Sam Licklider and I can't remember who the other person was. And 
This was a this was a Thursday, and um, game's over. He's getting beat by twenty something. So oh, he's got a motto: "Hey man, kill him with kindness. Just get him out of here. Don't do anything to bring any attention. Just hey, here you go. Okay, everybody's ready to go to the press conference. Everybody got their old Easter speech prepared. And so all of a sudden, I get two three calls, and all of a sudden I. I get this. Oh, that's a big call, Teddy Valentine. That's a big, he starts that clapping, that sarcastic stuff. And I'm looking at him going, you know, just looking. So now I make another call. Oh, yeah, another call. Now he does this like two, three times. Now the third time, he does it again. Now the game ends, and I'm going off the court, and I'm going, what's his problem? So, so I go down the steps, down the gopher hole, and he's behind me. Big call, Teddy Valentine. He's, I mean, I'm telling you, I thought maybe, you know, we, we might have to do something here, you know. So, <laughs> so at um, even Robbie would know that we make the right at the at the at the uh, at the arena. They make a they go right straight into the locker room, basically. And I'm got smoke in my ears about Bill Foster. I'm going, what's this damn guy's problem? What's this dude's problem? So Sam Licklider goes to me. He says. He says, uh, I'll see you Saturday because we're at Michigan State. And that's when Judd Heathcote was coaching Michigan State. This was before Tom Izzo. So I'm going, where are we? He says, we got Northwestern at Michigan State. Oh, no. Okay. I said, oh, that's bad <laughs> schedule. Okay. So now I show up and we're in a new place and we go shake hands. And he gives me this fishy handshake because he doesn't know I'm a communication person. He gives me this fishy handshake and smoke coming out my ears and I yelled at Sam Licklider I said Sam it's on <laughs> okay <laughs> it's on <laughs> it's that renegade in me so now we stand I go across the court and I don't I can't remember who it was but the ball goes up and the ball goes out of bounds and and nobody doesn't know who the ball goes off to start the game which is pretty bad and all of a sudden Bill Foster gets up he goes the same two guys I had on Thursday. Okay. So I'm going, what in the world's Bill's problem here? So now we're in the game going up and down, and all of a sudden Bill decides he's going to start the first five minutes. He says, Teddy, he says, you were MIA the other night. I said, what? He says, you were MIA. I said, come on, coach, let's go. We don't want to go down this road. Night keeps on going. Now his staff starts staring at me. I'll go, oh, I see how these guys are going to play it. Okay, they're just staring at me. I'll go, oh, okay, bad bad move, boys. So I'm going up down, trying to be my patience. He's on the road. And all of a sudden he said, you didn't respond to what I told you. I said, what was that? You were MIA. I said, okay, coach, I got you. I got you. So finally something happens and somebody does something and I turn to him and he, he goes crazy about something. I turn around and go, what? Technical foul. Bam. This is, must just get over with. He goes, oh, Mr. Big Shot. I said, Coach Foster, if I was MIA on Thursday, I got me a POW today. That's all I can tell you. you know? And I turned around. Of course, I got a phone call for that one, too. But, 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 but he was probably one of those guys that just always had a way to irritate me. But as he got through his career, as he got – as as I got around him a little longer, I got a chance to know him because there was one night he took his glasses off and put them in his pocket and turned to me and says, uh, says, uh, says, I got my glasses in my pocket, is what he told me. So I ran over to him I said, and I talked to him in time. I opened his lapel up. I says, you know what? I like the better we had Mr. Magoo on your eyeballs. And after that, he and I got along real good. You know, I mean, it was just one of those things. It was just one of those guys I had to find a way to warm up to. I think if we're talking about crazy coaches, this is a good time to maybe talk about Bobby Knight. I, I oh. went back and watched the three texts from 98. My, I already had a high level of respect for you just from being around you, from calling games you've done, from playing games, but did, that place was totally up for grabs. Can you just talk about what that was like? Well, it was always this thing that when I was a kid my dad used to tell me and i gotta tell you this story first to get to that one i had the fab five when i was young and my dad came to the game he was a marine 
And I was so, you know how it is when your dad comes and you're going, oh, my dad. And you start looking around the ring like, where's my dad? Where's my dad? You know? Mm-hmm. And that first time my dad ever seen me ref. And I lived in Columbus, Ohio at the time. And the Fab Five was playing at Ohio State. And I'm waiting for my dad, waiting for my dad, waiting for my dad. Of course, he rolls in there late. And they put him on the, they put him on the front row at Old St. John's Arena. So I ref and I'm smiling, my dad, you know, now, you know, my dad's here. Okay. I can't mess up now, you know? So the first time you get any money, like in your life that you want to show your parents, Hey, I, Hey, you've helped me, but I can help myself. So I took my dad across the street and took him to dinner and we're sitting there and my dad never said anything. He was a Marine. He'd come watch play sports. He never said hardly a word, but if you asked the old school, they were going to tell you and you wasn't going to like it. So I asked my dad, I said, dad, how did I do? He says, you want to know how you did? I said, yes, sir. He goes, you're not mentally tough enough. Wow. My father looked at me and brought, my heart went right to my feet. You're not mentally tough enough. You got that baby. Cause I came in the league. I was 26 years old, baby face looking kid. And, and my father says, you're not, you're just not mentally tough enough. He said, they'll eat, they'll, they'll run you over. And then he went on back to drinking when they did and he got real quiet. And I went home and had my tail between my legs. And, you know, says, couldn't believe my dad said that to me. Now we go back to the Bob Knight thing. That night, it was one of those things that as I came through my career, I was basically wasn't afraid of anybody. I just never had been afraid. This just always just been, I mean, that way. Because when you grew up underprivileged, what's afraid? You don't know what afraid is. You know, you, you're afraid you might not eat. You're afraid you might, you might not have a house. You're not afraid you might not have a bed. So I was never afraid. And so a lot of people don't know when I was coming into the league, I was to, Coach Knight used to have this fishing, fishing uh, show. And I would write him letters about fishing because I used to fish. And he'd write me back a letter. Yeah. And uh, he... It, He's had these fishing shows, and, and the first time I got around him, I go, man, this guy's a big intimidating dude, and and he intimidated me at first when I first met him, because I because I'd be within the crew, and and they would and the crews would change, they'd be like, yeah, calling me. He's changed. really tall too. He is a yeah, tall person. Like he's... Tall. He had that fiery red sweater on, yeah. and, and he was always yell and scream, and and if I was with the crew, the crew would, the crew dynamics would change. It would change mm-hmm. because when he yelled, all 23,000 people would just get quiet. Shoot, they shut down so they could hear what he would say. And I'm going, oh, man. And so the first time I came across him is playing Montana State. So I had to learn a little bit because I had a guy named Bob Wortman told me, he said, when you ref, you need to learn the opposition. And my dad used to tell me, you need to study and learn people along your journey because you're going to, there's something in that in that picture that you can use to help you down the road. So, so coach Knight comes out, he's got this, and then I'll get back to the Bob Knight thing. He come out with this, they're playing Montana state and he comes out with this powder blue sweater. Coach Knight wears powder blue sweater. He, has, he actually had their colors because he liked the coach. So I'm in the game and the other two guys I'm with, and they had made fun of me the night before. Cause they said, wait till coach Knight get a load of this young dude, you know? So, I'm out there and I'm reffing and Joe B writes on the bench and all that stuff. And I'm trying to be real quiet. You know, I'm trying not to say anything, trying not to do anything wrong, trying not to get no attention to me. Yeah. Just do your job. That's it. Just try to get out of here. This is my first year in the big 10. And all of a sudden he turns and I said, uh, come on, come on white. Come on. white." In fact, Steve Alford was playing for him. Steve Alford was playing. And I said, come on white. Come on white. Cut like a little cheerleader. Come on white. Come on down. And all of a sudden I hear, I hear, he turns around to me, excuse me, my friend says, God damn it, they'll be there. And he just kept, he kept saying it. So I tried to force myself again, shake and go, what is going on? I said, God damn it. I said, they'll be there. So I kind of kept, I said, well, he's either now or never. So I kind of forced the issue. I just kept forcing it. So they come out the huddle and he had to, he always had that, he always had something in his mouth or something, and he, and he always had them big black shoes. He always had them black shoes on, okay, because I always remember everything, you know. So all of a sudden, he yells. He goes, who in the hell's yelling about? I said, right, right here, coach. You got to bring him out. Well, I'll bring him out when the hell I want to. I said, well, coach, you got to bring him out, okay? 
And so, so finally he kept on talking and I, and I got inbound the ball in front of his bench and I'm going, and I'm kind of like holding the ball, but I'm kind of like shaking a little bit. I said, oh man, this dude here, man, yelling and screaming at me. And all of a sudden and I, I start calling him, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I just came, sir. And all of a sudden he turns to me, he says, God damn it, you don't call me, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So now I'm going up to the road. And he and he says, and he turns to me, excuse my friend, he says, You call three tight people, sir. Lieutenants, colonels, and is what he says. And he turns to Joe B. <laughs> right. He says, Joe B, I don't see him calling you, sir. Okay. So that was my first impression of meeting Coach Knight up close. Well, <laughs> All the years that I had Coach Knight, it was always be some interesting rhubarb because with with him back and forth. Sure. Uh, because I basically knew most refs were afraid. They were basically intimidated because I'd see him over talking and yelling at him, and next thing I know, I'd watch the next three whistles. I, I, I used to watch and go, oh, hell. But he would he basically would yell and scream and intimidate. But but I studied him. When the games were close, he didn't say much to you. When the games got wide open, that's when he would go. So I basically learned him over the years. You know, I tested him all the time. You know, I'll go, okay, let me find out what this guy's about. He's got, on the road, he'd be real nice, you know, and we could go back and forth at each other, you know, and, I, and, I'd, go, and I'd go back and forth. And back then, he was making this, uh, this NutraSweet commercials. And we got in a conversation one night and I had, and I reached in my pocket. I said, well, since you're showing your sweeter side of yourself, I'll show you my sweeter side. So I reached in my pocket and pulled out one of the Nutri- system packs and put it right in his hand, you know, whatever. And he started laughing. Oh, you got jokes, whatever. But, but I kind of like was trying to feel this guy out because I'm going, shoot, I'm going to be around this guy a long time. Okay. Because he, he was a very intelligent guy, very sharp. And so which, to answer Robbie's question, most of that situation went back from the 1992 Final Four when he played Duke, and I was involved in the situation. Um, I was in a, in a game with a ref who was afraid of him, and I whacked him, bam, in the Final Four, whack, boom. And it was always one of those things that every time that I'd, that I'd see him, it was always something from him. It was always something. It was always this venomous, this anger. It was always this. After anger. that, Ted. After yes, after that final four something. game, it changed. Yes, because I started seeing the way he was he was being. He was start coming at me more, and I'm going, wait, wait, wait man, now something wrong with this guy. And he just kept. I don't think he ever let that 90, 92 final four go. I don't think he ever let it go because that was the last time he was in the final four, you know. Mm-hmm. And I don't think he ever let it go. And I think that I was in the middle of it. And I basically think that uh, that the way he came at me that night, that he threw every left, every right, every jab that he wanted at. He me. emptied the clip, is what he did. Yeah, he tried to, but <laughs> but but it didn't work. Okay, because I basically I basically understood him. You know, I basically understood because I got angry at him at my mistake the first the first technical foul. I got angry. I wouldn't huddle and whack him the first one. We went right in his huddle. Did you? It, 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 it was like a street fight. I said, the hell with you. Here it is. Right up your ass. Here it goes. Okay? So after that, I kind of like subsided, and I got cool. I got real down. I got down. I said, okay, now, because he, he showed his venom, and I never showed no anger, because I was always talking to But when I went in his huddle and whacked him at his place, I meant business. I mean, it just wasn't going to be his – wasn't going to be his way. And so – so, like, through the course of the game, he kept coming at me and kept coming at me and kept coming, coming at me and kept coming at me. The more he came at me, the more I kind of like, okay, bring it on. Okay, that's the way I was. Like, okay, here I am. Uh, but I basically basically went within myself, got real quiet, real calm. Because if you know anything about a, per- about a rabid person, the calmer you get, they'll make a mistake. Okay, and and he thought he could intimidate me, and he walked around me at halftime and walked out the court, and the crowd was yelling at me, and and uh, was yelling, and people were throwing money, and really? and uh, and by then I told the other two guys because some refs have a tendency when something goes on they want to try to hug up the other people. Okay, walk off. Hey, I walked off. I waited till they left, and I walked off all by myself. And then I'm yelling, scream. I took my time, you know, and and I was the first one to come, the last one to come back out. So I basically knew 
where the situation was going to go because I knew he wasn't going to let it go. I basically knew he had bullets for me. And then, then he came at me again. And then, see, a lot of people don't know. The rule was you was only supposed to call two texts. Mm-hmm. I gave him three because it was one of those things that where it was an unforced situation because of the spring load of, of the basket they went down. And it was unfortunate that the rules changed since then because of that. And then I go to the other end. Well, here he comes. Like, you know, like, you know, does the same thing again. And I just stood there and let him talk. And see, the first time he came at me, I saw him out of my peripheral vision. And I had my arm up to my side of my face. And I'm going, this guy, this is a wrong, this dude. Okay. And when he got closer to me, he thought he was going to try to bump me, but I took my arms and I switched arms. Is by basically what I did. So I mean, so so actually, okie doked him on the floor. Well, that's because he's playing checkers, and I don't play checkers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's all, it's, I can laugh about it because I know you guys. So, so 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 two T's. Wait, wait. So two T's isn't you're thrown out. We have right? two. You're gone. Oh. But but when he came at me again, you hit him with a third. We wouldn't back. leave. He had to. As soon as he cussing me again, I went back to another one. I did. I gave another one. I'll never forget that because I remember forget Tommy O'Neill goes to me. He goes, Ted, now you know the rule. I said, Man, <laughs> forget the rule. I said, this is exceptional. I'm going to accept the rule, okay? So, so I remember the crowd was throwing money. I never they were throwing money all over the place. It was a free-for-all. From oh, watching but, the tape last night, it was a free-for-all. Hey, of hey, but to tell you what. But, but, but it was the calmest I ever been. I was real calm. Like they were throwing money and I was picking money up. Okay. I was picking the money up and, and the crew chief on the game wouldn't do anything because he was scared. So that's Eddie Hightower. <laughs> okay. So so I was picking his money up. I was picking the money up. And and Tommy comes to me, he says, says, Teddy goes, uh, we're gonna shoot two shots. I said, Oh no, we're shooting four shots. <laughs> and Tommy starts laughing. He goes, You got to be. He said, we're shooting four. I said, if I call him, we're shooting four. Okay. So, 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 so Tommy O'Neill's kind of snickering. Okay. He goes, boy, I ain't never seen no shit like this. Okay. <laughs> so, so I went to the score table and I carried all the money and I put the money on the score. And I had a handful of change. And I put it down on the, court, on the thing, but nobody wouldn't go to the PA guy and make the announcements. So I said, well, you know what? What the hell? My dad's Marine. I'll take over now. And I told the guy, I whispered in his ear, I says, if you're going to throw money, if you're going to throw money, Please throw more than a penny. That's what I told the guy. Okay. So I said, no, 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 you can't say that. Okay. But but I had a smile on my face, like, yeah, ain't no big deal. Okay. So um, so um so we went out the arena and and uh, my man Tommy O'Neill was going. By the time we got in the car and we had a few drinks, a couple people, Tommy going Neil going, I ain't never seen no shit like that. I ain't never seen no stuff like he says, you were a one man wrecking ball. Okay. He says, he said, you were just uh uh fearless you know i said i said hey we're in the jungle i didn't get your help and get eddie's help so what the hell okay so but i was a one-man wrecking ball but a lot of people don't know the next night i went to notre dame i'll tell that story on top of that so i go into notre dame and it's john mcleod and they're playing john thompson john thompson was like a father to me so i go to notre dame and the crowd boos from the time the game starts. The crowd boos. Okay. I'm just kidding. The crowd starts booing. And Mike Tirico and um, Mike Tirico and Lynn Elmore, they're going, Teddy, 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 how was it last night? I said, Well, I'm here tonight. We'll see what happens. Okay. Because I'm just one of those dudes, <laughs> you know. Because Art Hodden used to call me the Black Mamba. That's what he used to call me. He's on the court. I got the Black Mamba. You know, Art Hodden used to call me that. So um, I go shake John McClown's hand and the people at Notre Dame, the scores table are looking at me like, like people are always looking about looking at you like if you go through something tough or how are you gonna be? That's how everybody looks at you. So I go to shake John Thompson's hand. John Thompson going, John Thompson, may you rest in peace, goes. What in the fuck is wrong with Bob Knight? <laughs> so, so I said, what do you mean? He goes, he goes, he goes, he can't hurt no Negro. Okay, that's what Buster John Thompson says. Okay, so now I'm I've got like I said, well, Coach Thompson, if I was you, I wouldn't get too close to the fire because the iron's still hot. That's what I tell him. He's like, yeah, it's true story. So now, so now we're out there and we're wrapping. And Notre Dame people, they're on me. They are on me. 
So Pat Garrity played for Notre Dame, and he started acting up in the Georgetown game. I whacked him. Bam, here we go. Okay, we're on another, another roll now. Here we go, another game, another roll. So later in the game, Bubacar Al and Hickey gets into it. So they square up, and Bubacar Al gets ready to draw back and throw a punch at Hickey, and he misses, and Frank Scagliata runs in the middle of the play and gets hit in the nose, get knocked out cold, out. Frank Scagliata got punched by Bubacar Al, laid him out. The crowd, really? you can hear the crowd. I'm talking about he hit him, knocked him off his feet and everything. And I'm the trail, and I went, oh, my God. And I'm the crew chief, and all of a sudden I went, Skaggs is down, the place is bedlam. So now I got another double, double tech on Bubakal and Hickey. Got, now, got, now I got now three more techs. Okay, in the You've game, given seven yet. techs in two nights. That, yeah, that has right. to be a record. <laughs> so now I turn the score table, and I'm going, and John McLeod's going, Ted, Teddy threw a punch. And Franny McCafferty is assistant coach in Notre Dame then. I said, well, I got to go to the monitor. Well, before the monitors got to be real good, back then. So I went to the monitor. So where Bubakar went to throw the punch with a guy with the camera, takes the camera and swings it so we don't get it on tape. So so Skaggs, the um, trainer, Lori's getting up. She's getting, she's snapping off these castles. He's smelling salts trying to revive Skaggs. She, she's actually, you know, reviving with these smelling salts. <laughs> we see Skaggly out of asking. That was so funny. So now I'm trying to find this play. Can't find it. Notre Dame's going crazy. Teddy, do a punch, do a punch. And so I'm going, shit, how am I going to get out of this? It had to be the last Big East game of the year. And all of a sudden, I go down to Thompson. I says, uh, Coach Thompson, I got bad news for you. Bubacall's got to go. He says, go for what? I says, because he threw a punch. <laughs> so he goes, motherfucker, he ain't a punch. So I said, Coach Thompson, Bubacall's got to go. I said, he's gone. So Thompson all of a sudden starts going crazy. And I look up at Notre Dame and I point. I go, well, I'm certain I am climbing a crow's nest and go find that videotape. Okay. I said, now I got something for you if you just thought, go along with him. I said, I'll tell you what. Tell him to go to the locker room. I won't call it a fight. And he can play in the Big East tournament. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So now Thompson goes, that's the best shit come out of your mouth all night long. Okay. So now he goes. So. He tells Bubakal, he says, get your black ass in the locker room. So Bubakal gets up and runs. He just runs in the locker room. And, and so uh, Skaggs, they're trying to revive Skaggs. Okay. And Thompson picks, puts both hands on Skaggs. He says, Skaggs, Skaggs, you okay, Skaggs? <laughs> Skaggs says, yeah, coach, I'm fine. He goes, well, sure. Well, Skaggs, you sure can take a punch. Okay. <laughs> so now Tariko and Len Elmore's rolling. They're waving arms over to me. Teddy, come over here. And they both of them got this look on their face. They go, damn, Ted, you've been in Indiana 24 hours, man. It's a tough place. I go, I go, if I was you guys, I'd get the hell out of here too. <laughs> <laughs> but every time I see Lynn Elmore, he always brings that up, you know, about I mean, about that night. I mean, that's one, two adventurous nights I had in a row, back to back nights. It was back to back. It was like it just that never is incredible. Ended. It was just, but in that in that Indiana. Bedlam, that night that place was bedlam. It was, it was totally. It was totally, totally, and that place gets loud and it's it gets crazy. It was, so it's it was, just it from was, watching the videos. It, was, it was bedlam. It was crazy. It was. It, it's one of those things I've never been in the middle of like in my life. I mean, I thought I was. I mean, I mean, I've been on playgrounds. It was tough, but that night, I mean, them, those people, mm -hmm. it was unbelievable. I mean, they were just. They were just unreal. <laughs> but every time I see Lonnie Kruger, he always goes, he always goes, Ted, if we ever go into battle, I'll take you with me. Okay. And, and, and yeah, and that's a Lonnie Kruger. All he tells everybody his story. Lonnie Kruger tells him better than anybody. He says, I've never seen, I've never seen a person single handedly demolish somebody. He says, I've never seen that. I just, I've just never seen it. But, uh, but, but a lot of people think that, that I had something against Coach Knight. I never had. I never had anything against Coach Knight. Then I never had. A, I never had anything. I mean, um, I'm friends with Coach Katie. I always knew when Purdue and Indiana played. I always knew how it was going to be. Mm -hmm. Basically, knew. You know, um, I've worked that rivalry several several times. They were just very competitive people, and it was just. It, 
it was one of the, it, it's one of the greatest rivalries around. I mean, especially when they had good teams and they really got after it. I mean, yep. coaches didn't like each other, and you do it in a handshake. That's just the way it was. And you had to go ref the game. And if you were weak, oh, man, they were terrible. Man, Coach Katie, them guys eat you up. I mean, if you were weak, if you were a weak person, they they would eat you up. I mean, they would yep. just, they just would. I mean, but I've seen that Indiana game, I bet you. Over and over and over and over. The only thing I'm pissed off at myself is I should have threw him out sooner. That's what I should have did. You, you know, gave him I mean, three but teams. it was well worth it. It was drawn out though. It, it wasn't like a. It wasn't a bang bang bang. Like no, no, there was a lot going on though. With like Luke Records like laying on the floor, yeah, like injured and like, like there's so much going. You need to watch the clips. <laughs> yeah, oh, I've seen the clip. I try to separate myself. Also, like, oh my I, goodness. Yeah. I tried to separate myself from it. I was in a spot that I couldn't get out of. And it was just one of those things that, uh, I mean, that, yeah. see, but people don't know at halftime, he came back at me again <laughs> at the start of the second half. And and I was down stretching and I looked down his feet there and, I'm, and I look up and he's up over me yelling and screaming. And I went, I kept telling myself, don't stand up. Don't stand up. If you stand up, they, then it looks like that I'm trying to be the aggressor now. Right, so yeah, I'm kind of right. like, okay, well, all right, I'll stay down here. And and then so he just kept on going, and he just kept he just kept he just kept messing with me. He just and finally I said, you know what? I had enough of this shit. You know, it was just enough. It was. It was. It was one of those things. But but uh, but people used to tease me. <laughs> they go, what were you thinking about out there with Coach Knight after you? I said, well, I thought I was in Vegas. And you always bet on black is what I told him. <laughs> See, I got a good sense of humor about the whole thing. I still have a sense of humor. I just do. But a lot of people, they think, well, you know, this guy's scow. This guy's, this guy's okay. me. Yeah. That, that, that's one that we can laugh about a little bit. The, 